Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar express on imposter syndrome and how to beat it with our guest speaker, Caroline Donaldson, and which has been organised by the CIM Scotland Group. If you're a university student attending today's webinar, then you may want to sign up to the CIM Marketing Club. It will keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the market marketing industry. All you need to do is hover your camera over the QR code you can see on screen and that will take you through to the Marketing Club sign up page. So I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker for today's session, Caroline Donaldson. Over to you, Caroline. Well, hello everybody, and it's the weirdest thing sitting here with my laptop talking into my screen and my and my slides, and I'm not seeing anybody around me, which is very unusual for me because normally I'm either on the Zoom room, as I call it, with lots of little boxes and faces, or I'm in a real room with people. So I will do my best to be engaging and pretend I can see you and hopefully make it as if it was live with you there. So um, we're going to explore. Um, imposter syndrome today. It's a thing apparently and I want to get you thinking about well how is it for you and how does it affect you. So I'm going to share some techniques, some tips on how to beat it and with some actionable steps that you can take away and put into practice. It is loosely described as doubting our abilities and feeling like a fraud. It's a load we suffer from, apparently, but I do want to emphasise it's not a disease. What I do want to do is say, well, what is it and how can we change our mindsets? Because it is a psychological pattern in our heads. There are two psychologists that, that developed the concept called Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes, and they were focusing in particular on this project with high achieving women. And what they noticed was that um, underachievers cut themselves some slack and didn't really suffer from imposter syndrome the same way. So it's the high achievers amongst us that can be the worst affected. But it's not just women. It is often um, discussed with females, partly with a, a lack of role models around us, although that is beginning to shift too slowly, perhaps. Um, and also the lack of confidence hormone that we don't have. And you don't get a prize for guessing what it is, but it is testosterone. So um, in general, men have 10 times more testosterone, which is seen as a confidence hormone, than women. So with that in mind, just thinking about ourselves, and instead of thinking of ourselves as being rigid and can't move, what we need to realise is that many successful people in the world may suffer from imposter syndrome. It's something you can overcome. It does not have to hold you back. We just need to have the right techniques and understanding of where it comes from. And that's what I want to help you with. So we're going to spend a bit of time today examining your own beliefs. I want you to do a bit of personal reflection here about your achievements. And I want you to consider the various points that I'll make and the steps I'm going to put forward as building blocks or building pillars I talk about to overcome imposter syndrome. So it happens, as I say, to successful people, many of them. Um, a CEO of a bank recently became a CEO of a bank. Um, and he's somebody I worked with a few years ago. And he said to me, oh, I congratulated him on his new role. And he said, oh, he said, that's the imposter syndrome kicking in big time. Ha ha, laugh, laugh. But actually, I knew he would be really um, anxious about going forward. So... In terms of how do you help yourself, how did you get to where you are now in your career? People don't always present an accurate representation of themselves, which is why I've chosen this kind of face. We've got our own head and then we've got a mask in front of us. And how many of us put a mask on that covers up who we really are or does it not cover up? Um, I was working with a board yesterday and I was very aware there was one guy who was particularly um, what I would call aggressive and, and um, challenging and feisty because underneath it all, he was actually quite insecure. So he obviously was, was trying to cover that up. And that's quite interesting when that happens. So the thing I want you to do is to start really considering your reality, your own truth about yourself. So write down your achievements, get a piece of paper, jot them down and think of them as champagne moments. You're to celebrate them. So your own reality and truth is 
what achievements have I made? What have I done? The first thing that pops into your head, just, just scribble it down and then it will be followed by another one. You have your own skill set. You have your own knowledge. You have your own experience, your own thoughts, your own ideas. You make valuable contributions. And what you need to do is gather them. You need to note them. You need to take a notice of them because when you need to remind yourself of your achievements, it's really good to have the evidence there in writing. And then you can look back and go, oh, yes, I do remember that now. It's a bit like doing a CV or um, you're applying for a job. You start thinking about all the things that you've done. You want to have that current. Um, I've just met a lady this morning who's a strategic um, director in an organization, but she's not an executive. And that was really concerning her. She's going for a non-exec position. She's going for an interview today. And she said, I'm really worried because I'm conscious. I am not an executive director as all the other board members have been. And I said, well, that's not what you're going to be there for. Think about where you can make the contribution. What is your knowledge? What is your skill set? What are, what are you going to be able to bring that is not there on the board at the moment? And those are the things that we need to remember about ourselves. So I'm hoping you've got a few things written down that's making you think about yourself and remember. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a poll. And the, and the poll is really getting you thinking about how many of you believe you deserve to be where you are at? And you will now see you've got four options. Is it I'm just lucky? Is it I'm a fraud? Is it I don't deserve it? Is it I'll get found out? I've got another HR director story where I started working with this guy. He'd been an HR director for some many years. So this was not a new HRD. And he said, oh, I keep worrying about when they're going to find me out. I said, why? And he said, no, I haven't done anything. I'm absolutely by the book. But he said, how did I get here? And I said, well, if you really don't know that, we need to do a piece of work. And that's exactly what we did. We started to build up his evidence so he could see how he got to where he is in a deserved way. So we've got a huge number of I'm just lucky, 59%, really interesting. I'm a fraud is coming up a lot less, 4%. I don't deserve it, 4%. So my HR director, he would have been in there. Um, I'll get found out, he was in there as well. A third of you said that. So that's really interesting. I'm just lucky, took the, hot, the, the top spot. So let's have a look at the answers or a possible answers that would be there. Um, so this is, this is what people have said in the research that they've done. And how we see ourselves is so important. You know, it's not perfect. And I, I, that's why I'm not good enough. Others are much better. That's that comparing with other people. You know, they're on to me. I'll get found out. I'm a fraud. So really interesting that what you came up with in the poll is exactly what they found in the research. So let's look ahead. What exactly are we saying about imposter syndrome? Everyone feels like an imposter sometimes. So you might look at this and think, Oh, yes, there's the green quadrant, people who get imposter syndrome. And there's the orange quadrant, other people who get imposter syndrome. And then everybody else gets, they also get imposter syndrome. So what the message is here that everybody is going to get some feeling of imposter syndrome or I'll just call it a, a, a ripple. You know, it's that sort of wobble factor where you say, oh, my goodness, I'm out of my comfort zone. And so what I'm trying to do is get you realizing it's in your head. So if I can recognize it for what it is, this is your first pillar of things to work on. It is absolutely normal. It is totally normal that you are going to suffer with what I call a wobble when you're doing something for the first time or you're doing something that's a stretch, you are, um, you're building up, like my lady this morning, who was all worried about her ability to convince the board that she would be good enough. It's because she's not been a non-exec director before. So it is normal. It is also particularly normal amongst high achievers and found more in women than men. And I think I've already said that. Um, when you're on top of your game, you feel great. So see this as a way of getting on top of your game. And it's that constant learning and constant trying and striving. And it is a head thing. If you're feeling good, 
and you're on top of your game. You also have what I call a flow state. And if those of you are into sport in any way, whether you're a maybe a golfer or a tennis player, um, whatever the, the sport is, you'll know when it's flowing. It's much more, you, you, it, you, it's effortless. You just know it's working, it's happening for you. You don't know how you did that wonderful stroke or you don't know how you managed to hit the ball so high. You just know it worked and you wouldn't have had any interference going on for you, either around you or in your head, or both in fact, because you were in that lovely, focused, relaxed, concentrated state that is flow state when you're on top of your game. So just remember the wobble, when you're being a bit stretched out your comfort zone, um, don't say I'm a fraud, or I'll never make it, or I only got here because of luck, or for heaven's sake, I don't deserve it. No, 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 you need to just remember these are just insecurities. That's all it is. And you need to start getting comfortable being vulnerable. So if you don't have a stretch and you don't get out your comfort zone a bit, then you're never going to realise what you're capable of. And that's really um, another thing to be thinking about. OK, so hopefully this is um, getting some bells ringing for you in your own mind. So another way to look at imposter syndrome um, and I always remember a, a young guy I was working with. What I know is this slight, tiny bubble on the left-hand side. What I think others know was much bigger. Big assumption being made there. Because in reality, what others know and what I know are the same size of things. They might not be the same things, but that's okay as long as we know that. So the reality is not you know less. You know less on some subject, perhaps. And so we have to stop comparing. And this is pillar two. It's a really important pillar. So recognize it for what it is. Stop comparing. You have your own skill set, your own knowledge and your own experience. You just need to remember it. And what people present is not an accurate representation of who they are. I've already said that. So you need to remember it. You need to, if you're really wanting to be you and back to that flow state, connectivity and effortlessness, then you need to be authentic. Putting a face on, putting a mask on will show through. A bit like I noticed this guy yesterday on the board. So acceptance is key and accepting that when you are in a new role, when you are doing something you've not done before, you are definitely going to feel that wobble. And that's OK. It doesn't mean to say you've got nothing to offer and it doesn't mean to say you're not good enough. So let's move on to pillar three. This is for the high achievers amongst you, really, which I'm sure you all are. Um, and look how different and unique all these people are and therefore all we are. So you're not superhuman. You are a human being. You're just different. And we have to remember that we're all different and we have our unique abilities, our unique qualities. Um, you have your unique DNA. Nobody has your thumbprint. Nobody has your brain compilation, your, your, the way it's made up. Nobody. So you are absolutely unique. And if you took unique as being the thing to think about and have a unique special thing at home in your houses, in your, in your lives, you would be looking after that unique special thing. So here's something you need to be thinking about for yourself. What am I doing to look after myself? What are my own motivations? What am I interested in? What am I curious about? What am I learning? How am I growing? Because that's perhaps what motivates you. Or are you motivated to stand still? I would imagine most people who are interested in high achieving for themselves and doing well in their career and doing well in life actually are not going to want to stand still. So therefore you're going to be regularly out of your comfort zone and feeling that wobble. So we need to get used to it. So if our motivations are growth, then we need to realise, well, there's no such thing as failure. And um, I've got that growth mindset. I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to say yes. I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to learn. And if I don't do very well, that doesn't mean to say I'm a failure. So keeping yourself fresh is also part of this being human and not superhuman, but understanding your motivations and having that growth mindset. And tell people how you feel. Share with them. I'm learning this. I'm doing that. I'm feeling this. Have you felt that? And you know, the more you share with other people, the more you open up your growth mindset. So I want to try and 
get you thinking about something that's maybe practical just to compare. And I, because I can't ask you, and I don't know this, you might be drivers, as in driving a car. You might be able to drive. And if you are, are able to drive, the chances are, or it could be a bike, you had to learn how to do that. So when you first got behind the steering wheel of the car and you think, oh, this is going to be easy. I've watched my mum, my dad, my uncle, whoever drive, my brother, my sister. I'll, I'll pick this up, no problem. I bet the first time you drove, you had all sorts of problems. You would have, you know, stalled the car. You'd have got the, the, the um, indicator mixed up with the windscreen wipers, whatever. Um, you would have crunched the gears if it was that kind of a car. You'd have taken the clutch off too soon. And you'd have been bobbing along in your kangaroo petrol, as I used to call it. And it takes time to perfect our ability to drive. So why would it not be the same for our ability to do anything? It takes time, it takes practice, and it takes a constant repetition. So you don't pass your test by not driving. You pass your test because you kept driving, you kept learning, you kept getting better, and you could feel it and see it, and you didn't give up saying, I'm a fraud or comparing yourself with other fantastic drivers, or I'll never get it. You did it because you wanted to keep driving. So I wanted to take something that was real and possibly really important in your life, getting about in a car might have changed your lifestyle. I don't know. But think of something that you have put your mind to and you have worked at it and you can now do it. And maybe our time in the pandemic has given us an opportunity to do that a lot of people have taken up a new interest in something a new hobby or um have done something for the first time they've never done before and they've now learned a new language or they've learned to cook in a way they couldn't do before because they were interested and curious and they felt good doing it um, I met a guy last week and he's really working on his on his golf. And he said, well, I now play golf three times a week. He said, I've got my handicap down to 11. And this is only in the last year. And I said, wow, that's good. I said, what are you going for? He said, I want to beat my dad, whose handicap is seven. So there's his motivation. I want to beat my dad. Now, he's not saying I can't do it. He's saying he can do it. Therefore, I can do it. And that's an interesting one, isn't it? So he's comparing, but in a healthy way, rather than in, a, in an unhealthy way where we're seeing ourselves as being a bit negative on ourselves. So um, I'd love to ask you how you feel this is going, but I can't. So we'll just keep going. Pillar four, and this is your little brain. You're going to give it a good workout here. And some of my suggestions for this is building your confidence. You need to build your confidence with facts. And the facts are, um, like, where's your evidence? And that's why what we did earlier about noting down all your achievements and um, all the things that you know you do well, these are things that are facts. They are true. So remind yourself of them. The other thing is make sure you do things before you're ready. Say yes. Not, oh, I can't because I haven't done that yet. Say, yes, I'll, I'll do that. And then you learn as you go. Push yourself. Learn from those mistakes. That didn't go perfectly. It's OK. I'm learning. I'm a human. I'm not a superhuman. Remember that. Expect failure, actually, and say, yeah, I'll, I'll give that a go. But do it more than once. Don't do it once and get put off. Do it over and over again and then decide whether it's for you or not. And it helps build your confidence. There is no other way to get confident other than doing it. Reward yourself. So celebrate no matter how small. And those are what I term as my champagne moments. You'll have noticed that perhaps in my earlier slide. And the champagne moments are, for me, it's, it's a glass of champagne. I got that done. I did that thing that I've not done before. Or I got that piece of work that I've been trying to get. Or I got that proposal over the over the, the before the deadline i met the deadline whatever it is a little celebration and it doesn't matter to me how small it is and that rewarding yourself saying well done and being kind to yourself and celebrating giving yourself recognition might be one of the key factors that will help build your confidence and again knowing your facts so your credentials your experience your outcomes achievements the lady I met this morning preparing her for the board, she needed to get that in her head. Why are you going for that role? Not why, but what are you going to bring to that role? 
So again, developing trust in yourself. Before you're going to do something, you might have that wobble, a um, bit of nerves. Nerves are good. Wobbles are good. So how do you tr trust yourself? is part of building your confidence. I'll be okay no matter what happens. Even if everything collapsed on this laptop, I'll be okay. You might wonder what happened, but we'll reconnect. That's what will happen. So part of it is growing your self-awareness. How do you get more good up about who you are? And what are your talents? What are your skills? What are your strengths? And my idea is, is write down all you can think of. Really have talents, skills, strengths, labelled across a page, an A4 piece of paper or in a little book, um, whatever works for you. And, and as a coach, because I coach obviously um, for business coaching for individuals in all sorts of organisations, all sorts of individuals across, across the globe, which is really great for me, really privileged. I get an insight to other people's worlds, it's wonderful. And um, most people who are really focused and achieving what they want and learning, they keep a little journal, whether they call it a journal or their little book. I don't know. I've got a little green book. I've got a little black book. I've got a blue book. So I've got different books for different things. And I find my clients have the same. And taking a note, sometimes on a daily basis, what worked? What didn't work so well today for me? um might be another way to put it or what can i have done differently so what worked well what can i have done differently a very positive constructive view of learning but also building up my talents skills and strengths now some of my clients do that daily some do it weekly some of you might want to build into a sort of monthly routine for yourself and then you start really building it into your own development routine and so when you come to do your end of year review or your six monthly interim review or whatever it is you have in your organization, you've got a whole lot of evidence there already built up. But at the same time, you will have built your confidence almost without thinking. So it's a great thing to do. So write down all you can think of. Don't miss out anything. This might be some actions for you after this webinar. So you're getting some homework as well. Sorry, but it's all worthwhile. So then there's six more pillars I want to tell you about. And I really do love this idea of starting a smile file. Appreciate your worth and tell people, record it and look at it and check it over, go back over it. I don't care what you call it. It could be your self-appreciation journal. I call it a smile file. You decide whatever it is. And you need to tell a fan. Have some people there that you share it with. Now, this could be seen as being very positively influencing your stakeholders. It could be quite intentional, getting them to see you in a different light. And I have a number of clients that have done that and only to be in a better place at the end of it. So believing because you've done your smile file, believing your own worth, appreciating your own worth and then sharing it is a huge part of that. So good luck with that one. See how it works for you. Accept your partner's success. And that's about separating feelings from facts and referring to experiences. So if you can then say, well, I did this, I produced that, I made a contribution there, that was a decision I was part of, these are the facts, then you can refer to those different experiences when you look back. And what is great is if you have a bit of a bad day or you have an experience, a, a, a bit of a challenging conversation, perhaps with a, a stakeholder that's a very important stakeholder. If you've got this in a little file somewhere, you can go back to your smile file and just take note of what is it that you know you've achieved and appreciated in the past. And how can you use that fact and that learning to help you with this current reality? So it, it has loads of uses, a smile file. And then I've said about the telling people, share how you feel, trust yourself and others. And the more you share and the more you tell others, the more they are going to feel, gosh, that's, that's impacting on them too. And they're going to feel good. And they'll also feel it's OK to talk to you and share not just with you, but with others. So you start breeding a very positive behaviour with other people as well as yourself, which is a lovely thing to do. And then control your self-talk. You are good enough. Now, this this self-talk, some people will talk about their inner chimp, if you've read that book. 
um, or they'll talk about this um, self-talk or dialogue. The things you say to yourself, you know, like you you drop something and you say, oh, I'm a silly, I might do it. I might say, okay, silly woman, what do you do that for? And then I go, no, I'm not a silly woman because back to the brain not knowing. The brain only does what you tell it. So if I go around telling my brain I'm a silly woman, then my brain's going to go, okay, you're a silly woman. And guess what? It'll That will be the filter I will then use. So needing to control your self-talk might need a bit of work. That's where somebody like me as a coach can be really helpful or a mentor, really good. And that leads us to the next point, which is get a mentor or be a mentor. So getting a role model is really helpful. Somebody you can learn from, but somebody who's in a place that you perhaps would like to be. That's really good. But also, if you are the mentor, you can see good in, in the younger person and see yourself in that younger person. And that's really good to see. So it's a lovely flip, a lovely flip over. So um, mentoring is good for both. I, I would just do it. And the last point on these pillars is fake it till you make it. Back to the brain. The brain doesn't have a clue what is real or what is not real. It just responds to the words in your head. So if you say, I'm good enough, you say, I'm right, I'm making this work. If you say, I'm okay, guess what? It says, okay, and it turns it into real confidence. And you start faking it, and then it turns into reality. So how good is that? So those are my pillars. I hope they make sense. And I really just want to end with that play difference between elastic and, and rigid. Imposter syndrome does not have to hold you back. Be clear on your definition of success. Really important you see yourself in that growth mindset, that squidgy, moving, flexible one. And are you helping yourself? Because it's not rigid. You need to be moving with, with to grow, to, to help yourself, to get that, that imposter syndrome under control. There's more to you than you may think. So mindset is absolutely key. Shift your mindset and look forward to the next challenge. And it's that stretching yourself and finding out what you're all about is what really helps. So um, I hope that has given you food for thought. And we are now going to go and move on to our Q&A. Brilliant. That's great. Thanks very much, Caroline. That's some food for thought there, definitely. Um, so as you say, we're now going to have a short Q&A session. Um, so our first question is, um, they describe themselves as an introvert and they often get pressurized to be more animated. This makes mm -hmm. them feel that they're not good enough. How can they be more confident being themselves? Oh, well, I'm hoping there might be something in my presentation there that's made you think about that. So I think being confident with how you bring yourself is back to that authentic and maybe actually sharing how you feel about um, what you're being asked to do and what works for you. So actually being introvert means you think a lot and you, you process in your head differently than people who are extrovert. Extroverts need people all around them. They need a bit of animation. So you maybe want to be sharing what works for you and how you want to um, operate, but also ask them what it is they're looking for from you. And maybe it's not quite as negative as you perhaps are perceiving. Don't know if that helps. Yeah, okay. Um, the next question, it's a career-based one. Um, uh, it's from a director head of marketing um, level, who female, who's in the current market trying to find the next role. Problem mm. in today's market, there are hun hundreds of roles out there, but the specs, the role specs are specific to requirements, a particular sector, particular experience. Is it naive to think you could be considered, even if you have all the actual skills and experience, just not exactly what they say in the spec? I have a definite view on this one, I'm afraid, and it's an opinion. I think if you've got the skills and you've got the experience that gives you those skills, I think sometimes what people put in a spec is their ideal. You know, this is the 100 percent what we're yeah. looking for. But if yeah. you can convince them that you've got the skills and the experience that's going to contribute the way they need in their organization, then that specialist area is less important. So I would go for it without a doubt. And I would um, I would amplify the things that I'm bringing in how you appro approach that job. OK, um, and then the next question. Um, 
is, have you any tips for imposter syndrome caused as a result of returning for, to work post maternity leave? Um, have I got any tips? I think it's, um, I actually think it'd be really useful to get, when you're returning, have somebody to talk to when you come back. Now that could be a peer group, it could be um, a good line manager, it could be a mentor, but actually sharing how you feel is very much part of how do how do you begin to shift that imposter syndrome so having others to share with and talk about your balance that you are maybe not balanced but what you bring and how your self-worth has been affected by being away whether it was a year or six months because everybody has that re-entry issue when they come back even those who have done a sabbatical it's not maternity leave but they've taken a break they find re-entry quite tricky because the rest of the world in, in work has just carried on or moved on and it's how do you catch up so find a buddy find a, a set of buddies find peers find a group a support group and help yourself by by sharing with them that would be my my advice on that one okay thank you um next question have you any advice on handling peers who undermine you which then plays into imposter syndrome so I often help clients with this one. So I think there's two angles to this. There's why would somebody else's opinion or comments affect you to the extent that you actually end up self-doubting? So I'm like, OK, there's something going on there anyway on that confidence that would be worth having a good look at. And maybe some of the things we've covered today could help with that. But the other thing is you need to um, learn how to be really assertive and how to um, deal in a very moderate and controlled and neutral way the peers that are doing what they are doing because that their behaviour is not moderate their behaviour is not neutral and it's not it's not helpful so um, I would say there's a wee bit of learning there and coaching could be really helpful ah. okay um, now the next question is someone's asking how can they go about finding a mentor um, and before um, I ask you to answer the question um, just to remind everybody that CIM does have a mentoring scheme for its members as well you can find out more information about that on our website um, this this question is saying it's not something offered at their place of work and, and mm. in your opinion is it better to have an external mentor outside of the organization or an internal it's a difficult one because I don't think it's either or um, it depends what you're looking for from a mentor. So if you're clear about what your own objectives are, then depending on those objectives, it could be a career move you're looking for. So therefore, an internal mentor could be really helpful. If it's more of a um, learning from an industry-wide perspective or um, a more strategic viewpoint, then maybe going outside of the organisation would be helpful. And if you've got the um, the CIM mentoring scheme, I would have a look at that and see, well, how do I get one in, in there? If you don't, if you're networked in other networks, you might find a potential mentor there. Okay, thanks. Um, now, I'll, I'll combine two questions into one. Um, first would be how much of a person's negative self-talk is in, in their internal thinking is down to their own upbringing and then I've also got a question here um, to combine with that have there been cases where people with imposter syndrome ended up being bullied by arrogant peers and leaders and is there any research perhaps um I think the research there is research I mean there's oodles amount of research and I think the research would tell you that it's definitely links so if um if depending on our upbringing we've all had an upbringing <laughs> we've all got to where we got to and we got brought up by people so they you cannot help but be impacted on whatever happened in your childhood for for good and bad and so some of our self-talk we we need to or our internal kind of thoughts about ourselves we need to be um realistic about and think well um am i happy with the thinking i have about myself and if, if it's unchecked, then it what might lead to me having some kind of anxiety or even depression problem going forward. So how, what do we do to ourselves, with ourselves, to change our faulty thinking to more useful thinking? And is it rational? That'd be my first question. Am I thinking rationally or am I thinking emotionally? And if I'm thinking emotionally, then the chances are there's a reason why I'm upset and I need some help to understand that. If I'm thinking rationally, then where is the evidence for this thinking that I've got? Okay. 
Um, do you have any tips for supporting others that could be colleagues or, or friends who are struggling with self-doubt? If you identify it in other people, I guess that is, isn't it really? Yeah. Um, I'm a great believer in going and having a coffee with somebody. If it's a, a peer or colleague, um, just say, you know, I notice you're not yourself today or I've noticed over the last month something seems to be bothering you. Um, would you like to talk about it? Let's go and have a coffee and just keep it all very relaxed, very informal, but very supportive. And yeah. I think the more you can encourage people to talk, the better it is. Maybe not always to you. Maybe they need to go and talk to a professional. That might be the right answer. Um, I remember one one person I was going to coach and she said uh, what she was telling me. And I said, it's not a coach you need. I think you need a therapist. And um, she said, oh, I've had therapy for years. <laughs> she said, I, <laughs> couldn't, therapy. <laughs> I couldn't actually be talking about it. I had my therapy and I'm like, oh, my God. Right. OK. But yeah. <laughs> over on life. Um, yeah. So the next question is, um, we're back to the interview and, and changing career um, type question. How okay. would you approach a question in an interview if you don't ex feel experienced in that particular area? Are there any boundaries to the fake it till you make it? What has my experience taught me that I could use to show how I could do it in that new job? So you need to be really clear on and, and have the evidence that says I'm able in this because of what I've done. And I know I could transfer that skill onto this requirement in the new job, um, even though I don't quite know what it is you're looking for in terms of, say, it was a skill set or a process. But you can learn a process. But having the ability because you've already had the experience is really the transfer. Yes. Right. It used to say um, recruit for aptitude and train for skills, isn't it really? I suppose that yeah. would apply in that sense. Yeah. Um, next question is, um, what do you do if you think imposter syndrome is leading to more serious anxiety issues? And that could be stress or depression, I guess, as well. Yeah, if it was me personally, I would go and get some help. And um, you either go to, if it's in a company, you go to maybe they've got counselling services, HR, um, personally, I've gone to see a psychologist at times when I've needed that. And I, I just don't think there's any point, unless you've got a very good friend <laughs> who uh, plays that part or, or um, you know, somebody who is a mentor stroke counsellor type outside of the business. But you need to talk to somebody. You need help. You can't yeah. fix all that on your own. No. Um, right. So the next question. Um, I keep thinking I'm an imposter as I believe the companies are now so focused on young talent that I started to believe that my years of acquired knowledge and skills are no longer good enough. Moving mm. up has been um, in my mind and has become a challenge due to age. Um, could this be, like we were saying earlier about, um, it could be a culture or a, a different generational upbringing or linked to the way that people yeah. are being conditioned? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah it could be. There was a lady I, I was mentoring coaching sorry co coaching and she'd gone on this program which was only for women as leaders in this huge global organization as talented women she was 60 and she started off her coaching saying to me I shouldn't be on this program because I'm 60 and I said so why are you on the program what, what I, I didn't even bother saying shouldn't be but why are you on the program oh my manager put me on it and I said okay let's deal with that fact because that's the fact you got put on it because he wants you on it why do you think he wants you on it and of course it changed her frame it was all about framing in our mind if we feel we're past it too old then guess what the brain goes yeah yeah, you are. And, and what we have to do is keep ourselves fresh and relevant. I mean, that was one of my one of my moments in, in my slides talking about a growth mindset. Just because you're a certain age doesn't mean to say you've got nothing to offer. And in fact, if you offer yourself as a mentor, you'd be surprised how many other people who haven't got your experience want to spend some time with you. And my lady I'm telling you about ran all sorts of development for some younger younger people in their career career development and um, leadership programs throughout this this company in the last three years of her time she was going to be there because she was retiring at 64. so there you go <laughs> absolutely well done <laughs> um and i think we've got time for one more question okay. um from someone who describes himself as an introvert and perhaps communicates slightly less with the team in the office, whereas the, the rest of the team, and I think the key word here is team, because we're all individuals, aren't we, is extrovert. So she's not sure how to change for career progression. Would you mm. advise somebody changing? 
Um, just because you're different from the team doesn't mean to say you should yeah. change. No. In fact, it's almost like you need to show how your difference is helping that team. So yeah. we, if we're extrovert, then we don't take the time to do the reflection that an introvert does. It's just natural to an introvert to reflect more. And what a value that is to a team. So maybe you're keeping yourself too quiet with that value that you bring. And then my advice would be make sure your contribution is heard and decide whether being in an environment like that is working for you before you decide to move on to whatever else you're thinking of moving on to. Okay, excellent. And I think that's all we have time for now. Um, so thank you very much for that, Caroline. We've had some great okay. questions there from our viewers, and it's a shame we've okay. run out of time to get through more of the questions that have come in, but thank you very much for answering the ones that you did. We'll be back with our next webinar express, which is Colleagues as Consumers with Dr. Eloise Leonard Cross on Thursday, the 9th of June at our usual time of 1 p.m. You will find further details about the webinar listed on the events page on the CIM website, where you'll be able to register for the session. So that just leads me to thank Caroline once again for a fantastic presentation and to say a thank you to you all for joining us today. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to welcoming you again to our webinars in the future.